When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder. hoping and praying that when that trumpet does sound that you'll be caught up together with them in the clouds and the Bible said we'll forever be with the Lord. Amen. We come to you again another week uh, on, online with our message uh, for the week which is Easter weekend. We really hate that we're not able to meet at church. Um, it's just something so different than what we've been used to. But you know, we're going to come out of this uh, better. And uh, we just trust in the Lord that he will guide our president, our leaders. And uh, you know, there are certain things that we, you know, we have civil disobedience on. The Bible tells us, you know, if they tell us to quit preaching the gospel. Well, you know, of course, we won't obey that. But uh, as far as health and safety right now, we're trying to, to uh, help and uh, keep, keep our people well. So we are praying for you, and we ask you to continue to pray for the church and pray for one another, pray for me as I bring the message today. I'm glad to be able to come to you once again. The Lord's given uh, me help to be able to do this, and I appreciate being your pastor. And uh, I love you and love the church. We hope this might be the last Sunday. We're hoping that we got to meet like this. We don't know how long this is going to go on, but we ask you just continue to support the church and pray for us, okay? Pray for those that are shut in and sick, dealing with this. Our uh, people that are essential workers, pray for them. Of course, our nurses and doctors, and uh, i got a, a grandson that's, that's an essential worker, and he's working, uh, but... Uh, and those in the service, armed services, um, uh, just truckers, you name it. Those in the stores, uh, you name it. And you be nice to them, amen? The, the waitresses, all that, be nice to them. Uh, they can't help this is going on, but I want you to be really nice to them and treat them well, okay? Uh, and you know, to adorn the gospel of Christ. Uh, I want to begin our service off today by, by, with a word of prayer, by praying uh, we, we have much to pray for, and, uh, you know, our nation has kind of in a way been brought to its knees. And those saying, I've always used and always heard that sometimes the Lord has to get us on our flat on our back while we look up. And, you know, I, I, I heard the other day that, that um, somebody was telling me that they're selling out of Bibles at Walmart, <laughs> places like that. That's a good thing, amen, as long as we're reading them, as long as we're putting them into practice long as they find in Christ. Amen. It's all worth it. 
Uh, so uh, we, we have a lot to pray for, and we want to take this time to pray for the message and uh, that it'll, that'll reach those that, that don't know the Lord. And I, I can't save anybody, but it's the Lord, the Holy Spirit, that goes in, uses His Word, the Word of God, the Bible, to go in. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit convicts hearts and, uh, and, and draws them to Himself. And so that's my prayer today. He'll do that. And I want to pray for our nation today. We're in need of prayer. We, we're such a wicked nation. Uh, uh, some of the essential things they said are, are, are open, and I can't believe this, that this is an essential thing, abortion clinics. Now, you know, I've always heard, too, that, you know, we, we ask the Lord to bless us, and as long as we live for the devil, he's not going to bless us to live for the devil. Amen? So there's some things in our, our society we need to repent of and take care of uh, to make things right with God. I mean, their blood literally is like when Cain killed Abel in Genesis, the Lord went to uh, Cain and says, his blood cries out for me from the ground, to me from the ground. And so blood is a living thing, and that's what it took to buy your salvation on Calvary's cross uh, is the blood of Christ, a special kind of a special sinless blood uh, to, to purchase your salvation. And Jesus said it's paid in full. So their blood literally cries from the ground. And so that's some of the, one of the greatest sins our nation has, hands that shed innocent blood. And you pray for our nation as we repent of these things. And, and you know, let it start with your own heart. I mean, don't think, well, somebody else has got to do it. No, it starts in our own heart. That's where uh, repentance starts. And then let somebody else worry about their own heart. Amen? So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll begin our message. Father, we come today. Thank you, Lord, for being always the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, we thank you for who you are. Always here. Always with us. You said you would be with us to the end of the age. And you even said in your discourse in Matthew 24 that... As we got closer to the, the end of, uh, of time, the end of the age, and the, the closeness of your approaching or your coming, uh, your second coming, that there would, there would be a signs. And one of those signs was pestilence. And, Lord, that's what we're dealing with here today is pestilence in our land, our country, our world. And so, Lord, we come today, uh, as we read your scripture, we see that pestilence uh, was placed upon your people, the Jewish people, Israel. Many times in the Bible, and you said that if they would turn to you and, and call upon your name, that you would deliver them. And so, Lord, I'm coming today, and I'm asking you to forgive us of our great and, and awful and mighty uh, deadly sin, Lord, in this country. That you have mercy upon us, Lord. We deserve judgment, but, Lord, we're we asking for mercy. We're asking for grace, Lord, through the blood of Christ, that you have mercy on us. Your name be glorified through this. And, Lord, you just spare us uh, the judgment that is ultimately coming. And so, Lord, we thank you for sending Jesus into this world. We come Easter, uh, Passover, and celebrate the death, burial, and the resurrection of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. And help us to think on him this morning. And, Lord, just think about him and, Lord, what he had to endure uh, to purchase what we have today. We can call upon your holy name without price. Uh, without charge, Lord, it's free grace, free will, free salvation, Lord, that we, we call upon your holy name this day and ask you to have mercy upon us. Be with our president. Lord, give him, give him uh, wisdom, Lord, as he leads our country. Be with our pastors, Lord, across the country. Help them preach the unvarnished truth of God, Lord, that, that uh, we'll, we'll come to our senses and stop sinning, Lord. Help us consider who you are. And you're still on the throne, Lord. Use this message today to speak to hearts. I thank you, Lord. I'm unworthy today, and I need your, I need your blessings. I need your strength, Lord. I have no strength. I have no wisdom, Lord. I've got nothing to offer except a vessel, Lord, to, to proclaim your word. Now use this, this mouth and this heart, and Lord, today to do your will. And we ask it in Jesus' name, his precious name. Amen. And amen. Now, I want you to think about, uh, you know, Jesus. This has been on my mind uh, all week about we, we, we come to this time of year, uh, which is known in the Bible as Passover, 
and, and uh, we know it is Easter. And so I, I, I was wondering about where we came up with this Easter, you know, Easter and Passover. Passover was actually this past Thursday for the, the Israeli nation. And, uh, you know, there's tremendous things going over there right now. I was reading the other day that uh, some of the leaders there in the religious Jewish community was wanting Netanyahu, who is the leader of Israel, to allow them to go up on the Temple Mount. Uh, they have an altar already built, the burnt altar that they sacrificed the lamb on and, 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 and uh, sacrificed their lamb for the first time in 2,000 years. They said the temple is important, not that important. You know, we're the temple of God now and the Holy Ghost. Uh, but, uh, but the altar is the most important thing and the incense. It's one of the most important things is that priests burn the incense. They got all that ready. And so we're living in some tremendous times. And they were saying that the incense need to be burned and prayed to, to ward off this pestilence. And I think it's something to that, amen. But I, think it, I thought it was a great uh, a, a portent of things going on in the world today that they're wanting to start their sacrifices back up on the Temple Mount that hasn't been done in over 2,000 years there in Israel. But we know it is Easter. You know, Passover was this uh, Thursday. If you ever notice the full moon, it's always on a full moon. Uh, Jewish uh, things go by the, by the moon phases. Full moon, Passover, every year full moon. And uh, they count it. I forget how they count it, but it's counted that way. And it's a command by God. The Bible said it's the Lord's Passover. And we, of course, go back to Egypt where God passed over uh, the firstborn, of everyone, that family that had the blood applied to their doorposts and their lintels of their door, is that uh, a death came through that night and, and took the firstborn of every family that didn't have the blood applied over their doorposts. So the blood is important. I want to emphasize that today, but I want you to think about Jesus. And the only time that we have the word Easter in the Bible is in Acts uh, chapter 12, verse 4, and it mentions it one time in the Bible. Now, I wondered why was that, uh, but uh, when Peter was in prison there by Herod, now this was after the resurrection, this was after Jesus had sent him back to heaven, he put Peter in prison to uh, kind of uh, please some of the Jewish leaders, kind of get in good with them, and uh, it was, the Bible said it was the days of unleavened bread, so by that we know it was Passover, but when they translated this in 1611, the, the word will actually pass over, and they translate it as Easter, which is a Latin word, and it just kind of means springtime. And, you know, of course, Easter uh, appears every, uh, uh, every spring. You know, it's a, a, a good time of year for new beginnings, for Passover to come, Easter to be, amen, in the springtime. But, uh, but uh, he was intended to bring him out to the people, probably have him executed, but God spared Peter. And uh, what got me about Peter was he's going to be beheaded the next day, and he's sound asleep in his, uh, in his jail cell knowing that God was keeping him. He done told him he'd live a long life, so he wasn't worried about it. And, uh, but uh, prayer was going on for Peter at that time, and that's important. Now, that's the only time that uh, uh, Easter is mentioned in the Bible, but it was named back in the early church sometime, and it was translated as Easter. Easter, but it's actually, when we say Easter, we, we, we talk Passover, amen. It's been celebrated for something like uh, 3,500 years, so it's been a long time when they first came out of Egypt like that, and Jesus became the first uh, Passover uh, lamb, and so I want, I want, I'm thinking about Jesus today. Uh, today is Good Friday. Uh, when I'm preparing this message, it's Good Friday. And the time you hear this, it's going to be Sunday morning. It's going to be Resurrection Sunday. Amen. The most important day on the, on the Christian calendar is Resurrection Sunday. But today is Good Friday, and I, I, I'm thinking about what he went through uh, a Thursday night. My grandma used to always tell me, son, you know, she's talking about planting a garden. And by the way, it's time to do that. Uh, but um, she said, you can have anything you, you want planted after Good Friday. And I always wondered, well, what, what's Good Friday? I mean, why why they call it Good Friday? Uh, they told me about Jesus, you know, dying and on the cross, and I thought, well, that don't seem very good to me. But the reason it's good is because he died for us. He died in our place, amen. He was our substitute that died for us. That's what it made it Good Friday. But Jesus tr 
suffered a tremendous amount on this Good Friday 2,000 years ago. Amen. On that Thursday night, I was thinking about what he went through that Thursday night in Gethsemane. And, you know, that's really um, where he suffered. I, I think about the mockings and the scourgings and the, the beatings, the humiliations. And I think about the praying that he did. He played, prayed a tremendous amount in that Garden of Gethsemane. He really did. He, he agonized over uh, what was before him. And so uh, he prayed. And there in uh, uh, Matthew 26, 36, uh, the Bible, uh, Matthew 26, 56, he says that uh, when he was praying, he was utterly all alone. Amen. All alone. And, uh, and uh, he says here uh, that... When all this is done, the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled that all the disciples foot, forsook him and fled. So Jesus here is all alone. They, when they came to get him, they forsook him, they fled, and uh, they just left him. And the Bible goes on to say Peter followed afar off. He followed him as they carried him to the temple, to the, the, uh, the house of Cephas, the high priest, and he, he followed afar off. And that's, that's where some of you are at today, see? You're following Jesus from afar off. And you know, that's not the place to be. The place to be and the safest place to be is following Jesus uh, 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 beside him and near him. The Bible said we come under the shadow of his wings, as I said a week or two ago, that when you're in the shadow of his wings, you're in a safe place. Well, that means you're near to him, amen? But it says Peter followed afar off and... So I was thinking about that, how he was utterly all alone, all alone, all alone. Um, and it's asked the questions of why, why? Even Jesus asked why. You know, things happen to us in life, and it's not wrong to ask why. I mean, things that happen in this life to us, we don't understand. We don't, we don't have the full picture. The Bible says... Right now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. We'll see face to face. We'll know why this and why that, but we don't know. We want some explanation. But somebody told me one time, it's not ask why, but to ask what. You know, what? What do you want me to do with this, Lord, when I go through a, a great trial in my life? Lord, what do you want me to do with it? What do you want me to learn? Do you want me to draw closer to you with this? Uh, but the whys of it. Jesus asked why. This is one of the most uh, heart-wrenching whys in the Bible. As he hung on the cross and he says, Why have you forsaken me? Father, why? My God, why have you forsaken me? Don't we feel like that sometime? That God has just forsaken us? But see, God was working a plan through his own very own son. Even Jesus says in his humanity, the Son of God says, Why? Why? I've asked questions many times. Why, Lord? But one day, in the by and by, we'll, by our old song says, we'll understand it better by and by. Amen. So we've got to wait. Sometimes we just have to wait on the Lord. Everything's going to come out in the wash sooner or later. Amen. But he agonized in prayer. And um, I think it's in Matthew 26, 36. Let me look here right quick. And, uh, yeah, he comes, then comes Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane and uh, said to his disciples, sit you here while I go and pray yonder. Now this is when he's the night before, Thursday night, before he goes to the cross Friday. He's up all night long. They come that night and arrest him. He's up all night long, up all the next day, hung on a cross by 9 o'clock the next morning. And it says here, and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee who were James and John, and they began to be sorrowful and very heavy. They never seen him like that. They never seen Jesus. The Bible said they saw him joyful. They, they saw a, a, a man full of grace. And now all of a sudden, the one they've walked with for three, three and a half years is getting very downhearted. They'd never seen him like that before. You ever get downhearted? Jesus did. He got downhearted. He wondered why. Why? Maybe God hid it from him. He didn't. See, he laid aside all of his royal uh, deity, everything. He, he laid aside his omnipotence, his omniscience as he came down here. Some things he didn't know. Even the second coming, he says, that's not in my power to know. Only the Father knows that day and hour. Amen. 
He only knows that. But it says, uh, My soul is sorrowful, exceedingly sorrowful, unto death tarry you here and watch with me. And he went on a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy will be done. And that prayer we need to pray lots of time. Lord, not my will, but your will be done in my life. Amen. That's what Jesus told us to pray in the 23rd Psalm. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, when he tells the angels to do something, they do it. They, they go to sharp attention. They do it. Not like us. Well, we put it off. They do it. Amen. May his will be done. But he agonized in prayer. Pressed without measure. And this is a place called Gethsemane. And you know what Gethsemane was? It was among the olive trees. It was actually an olive press. Jesus was being pressed out of measure. He was being pressed out of measure. And what was that cup he so dreaded? Lord, Lord uh, Father, if it's possible, verse 39, Matthew 26, 39, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Well, it was that cup with all kinds of sin that had never touched his lips, never touched his heart, never touched his mind never touched his soul, never touched anything. This pure, sinless, undefiled Son of God is now about to become sin, and he's going to lay sin on. That's what he dreaded. I don't think he minded going to the, as much going. He didn't dread going to the cross, but it was taking this cup of sin, your sin and my sin, all the black things that are in our heart that we do. We put him there. We murdered him. We killed him. And that's what he so dreaded. The Bible says in Mark 14, 33 and 34, he became so amazed during this ordeal of Gethsemane. See, this is where his battle really was in Gethsemane. In a garden, amen? In a garden, too. It was part of a garden. And he became very heavy. And the Bible says he became even sorrowful unto death. Sorrowful unto death. I mean, the pressure was so great on him that he thought literally he was going to die. Some people said, as I've read reports about uh, medical things, uh, that, um, that Jesus should have already been dead before he got to the cross because of the great, tremendous amount of stress on him. And not only that, but the whippings he received and the scourgings he received. Most men never survived that. But Jesus, as strong as he was, he survived it because it would not do for him to die without getting on that cross, amen. That had been prophesied. He prophesied, they pierced my hands. Over in the book of Psalm, Psalm 22, they pierced my hands and my feet. See, he foretold his passion many, many years before he came. The Bible says in Luke chapter 22, verse 44, it says that he... Uh, Great drops of blood fell to the ground. Let me read it right quick. Uh, 22 and 44. He said, uh, uh, and uh, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Uh, and his sweat was as were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, he was wrestling tremendously. He was in a, a wrestling match, really, is what he was in. And he was fulfilling what God had said to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.15 that says, when God says to Adam and Eve, and you know Adam and Eve, I believe, is in heaven because the Bible said God clothed them with animal skins. See, that was, I believe it was a lamb skin that he clothed them with because there's the first blood that had been shed besides, uh, you know, Cain killing Abel. But now God had provided us a, a, a sacrifice for them to be saved, and he clothed them with animal skins. And he told them, he says, through the seed of the woman, I'm going to crush the serpent's head. And this is what he's doing. He's, he's wrestling in prayer with all the demonic forces of hell right now. He wasn't there alone, really. I'm sure Satan was sitting on one shoulder saying, don't do it. You know, he done appeared to him in Matthew chapter 4. And the Bible said when he tempted him, he showed him all the kingdom of the world. He can be yours if you'll fall down and worship me. I wonder what Satan was whispering in his ear then. <laughs> you don't have to do this. 
This is not the way. This is not, this is not God's plan. This, you don't have to die. You don't have to go to this much trouble to save them. I would go back. I wouldn't die for them. They don't appreciate you. They don't love you. They've done whipped you. They've done, you know, pulled your beard out. That's what they're going to do to you. But he's wrestling. The Bible said that great drops of blood fell to the ground. Spurgeon says, I like Charles Spurgeon. He was a preacher that lived back late 1800s. Great man of God. And I, I read some of his, uh, if you see me post them on Facebook, that's why I post them where I can save them. But I hope that some of you read them and enjoy them. But he says, do you see the tremendous weight that sin carries? Now we, we done said he was sorrowful almost unto death, sweating great drops of blood, saying, Father, let this cup pass from me if there's any, any other way. Do you see the tremendous weight that sin carries, your sin and my sin? That it was able to crush our sinless Savior and cause him to sweat great drops of blood. This demonstrates the great power of his love for you and me. Most men, when under stress, their blood will rush to their heart to strengthen him. But his blood drives outward to wet the earth. He pours, literally pours his life out on the ground. The Bible said the, the, the life of the flesh is in the blood. He sweated blood rather than yield to the temptation of going back to heaven without uh, accomplishing what he came to do. And how intense was he wrestling. And see, yes, he was wrestling, and this is where the battle was actually won. There, I believe, in the Garden of Gethsemane. I really believe it was when he decided resolutely to die in your place. That's where the battle was. Not my will, Father, but your will be done. You know, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that we don't even wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't come to church and fight against other people. We think we do. We try to make enemies of that one, the deacon, the preacher, or whatever, uh, our brothers and sisters. But that's not who we fight against. God says, wise up. We fight against demonic spirits in high places, the Bible says. Get your Bible out and read Ephesians chapter 6 uh, over there. In uh, starting around about verse 12. I was reading this the other day. It's spiritual wickedness in high places. That's who we fight against. They whisper in our ear. They, they bring temptation our way. They say it don't, you know, they tell us, it don't pay to serve the Lord. But it does. Amen. It does. Uh, it says we wrestle against principalities. That's chiefs. You know, they have rank, file, and order just like a military. That's what... The spiritual forces are demonic forces. It tells us a little bit about it. Powers, which are human, superhuman potentates. Uh, rulers of darkness. Uh, the, the word here is world rulers in obscurity. They in obscurity. They don't want to be known. Uh, this um, spiritual wickedness in high places. And the Bible says to uh, beat them. That means uh, those in heavenly places. To beat them, we put on the whole armor of God. That's the only way we can fight them. God has given us everything we need to fight them. He's given us the Holy Spirit to live with inside of us. He said, above all, taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Amen. And your faith, he said, with that you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Your faith. Don't let the devil rob you of your faith, your assurance of what God says, because that's where our strength lies in our faith. Not my feeling. I might feel saved now, but when I leave here, I may not feel too saved. I may have a bad thought. But see, I can't go by my feelings. I go by the Word of God. I go back to the Word of God and say, this is what the Lord says. And that's what I believe. Regardless of all my circumstances, regardless of all how I feel, I'm going to believe what God said because he cannot lie. He's not a man. He said he cannot lie. Amen. He cannot lie, but he was wrestling. And it was where he wrestled in three places. Gabbatha. You know where Gabbatha was? That was in uh, where Jesus was tried there in the Pilate's court. Gabbatha. Where he was tried. Where they cried, crucify him. 
crucify him. You know, read into, he rode into uh, Jerusalem the Sunday before on Palm Sunday. They were crying, Blessed is he coming in the name of the Lord. Amen. Hollering, blessing, praise the Lord. And then next week by Friday, they holler and crucify him. But he wrestled there in Gabbatha. Pilate said three times, I find no charge of death in this man. I find no fault in this man. Three times. But yet they still carried him to the cross. And the next one was Gethsemane in this garden, the olive press. Pressed out of measure. Pressed out of measure. And Golgotha, the place of Calvary. That's where he wrestled. For six, eight long hours on that cross, the place of the skull. And we can't forget the grave, amen, the tomb that he came out of on Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, Passover Sunday. He came out of that tomb, amen. And it's something, they all happened in a garden. Man lost uh, his fellowship and his walk with God in a garden. And the Son of God, the second Adam, comes back and, and wins it back. And restores it in a garden, amen. In a garden tomb. Isn't that something? And we just praise the Lord today, amen, for what he's done. I want you to think about Jesus today. I want you to think about him today. Of all days, think about him. By the way, he's coming again. And when he comes again, he's not going to be some little lily-livered lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The Bible said he's coming as king of kings and lord of lords. He's coming as a lion of the tribe of Judah to rule with a rod of iron. He's going to punish iniquity. So that's why we say get ready now if you're not ready right now. Get ready because you won't have time when he comes. So why did he choose to suffer for you and me? Love. The Bible said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. That means hell, but have everlasting life. Don't want to live forever. Don't you want to go to heaven? I, I ain't met a single soul. It might, it might be a few of these crazy atheists somewhere. Uh, somebody said the other day, you know, uh, you know, that there's no such a thing as fairies. Or, uh, or unicorns, or what else was it? Something like that. But they're not mad at them. Well, what are they mad at? God. They say, I don't believe in God. They're mad at God. If he said, don't exist, why are you mad at him? Be like a tooth fairy or whatever. Amen. So, yeah, yeah, they know God's real. They know it deep inside. And, but he loves even them. Amen. He loves you. He wants you to know him. Now, this is the thing about sin. See, that, that's the good news. Jesus won our battle. He wrestled and he won. He won that battle over sin, death, hell, and the grave. He won it. But you know what sin is? It is a, this is another quote from Spurgeon. It's a thing God must punish. It's a law of the universe. He can't, he can't overlook it. He, he can't just do away with it. His eternal laws demand it. And it is death. And the word death in the Bible means separation. Separation from God forever. Can you imagine living in a world without God? We can see God in this world here. All the flowers and the, the spring, the sunshine, and, and the birds and all that, and our loved ones. We see Him. But there, there is no God. If you believe on Jesus Christ, then Christ died for you. And God cannot put two to death for one of offense. Amen. He can't put two to death for one, one offense. Nor can he ask payment twice for one debt. Our own country's laws are, are written that way out of the Bible. You are therefore free. Christ paid the debts of all his people and obtained their full discharge when he rose again from the dead. And the Bible said in Romans chapter 8, Who is he that condemned? It is Christ who died and rose again. Amen. Yeah, so you're no longer in condemnation if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today. Uh, and that's, that's the good news. I mean, that's, that's great and good news. But this is the bad news. Those that won't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ must bear their own iniquity. And the Bible said the wages of sin is death. You don't want to bear your own iniquity. 
bestowed upon the, the sin bearer, the Lord Jesus Christ. No sprinkling can wash out sin. No confirmation can confer grace. No mass can pro propitiate God. Your hope must be in Jesus. Jesus smitten, Jesus bruised, Jesus slain, Jesus the substitute for sinners. Whoever believe in him is healed. All others are a lie from top to bottom. Amen. It, it really is. I got a story here before I close I want to share with you. And it's called Old Jim. And it's a story that touches my heart. We, the well, other night we were there and my grandson had a book that I believe it was called the, uh, um, what, the uh, Lily of the Valley or the Rose of Sharon, Little Rose of Sharon, Little Flower of the Rose of Sharon. And of course the Bible calls him that, Jesus that. The Rose of Sharon, Lily of the Valley, uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 1. But he read that, and uh, the little rose gave its uh, petals uh, for a little dove egg, and it was a real nice little book. And we got to the point where the Creator comes up to the Rose of Sharon, and, and he says, uh, you know, I, I, I bless you, something like that, because you, you sacrifice yourself uh, just like my son's going to do. My grandson got to that. And he's, he's tough. And he, he teared up a little bit. And it made all us tear up. Amen. It really did. But I, I love all my grandchildren. I'm glad they're saved. So this story I'm about to share with you is kind of the same kind of story in a, in a way that make you tear up a little bit, I think. And it's called Old Jim. He took my whipping for me. A man tells a story about um, that happened in a school he went to many years ago. It was a country school, and nobody had been able to tame any of the boys uh, there in that school because of, they were so rough. I mean, they were just they were incorrigible. You could he just nobody could handle them, and they had trouble keeping teachers there. And so one day, a young man uh, applied for the job. And so the director says, you, you know what you're in for? And he says, I can handle them. So he showed up to work. First day, a big old fellow named Tom says, tells the other guy, I said, don't worry about him, I can lick him myself. Teacher gets up there and says, good morning, boys, we're here to have school. And what they did, they yelled at the top of their voices. <laughs> Some of y'all teachers have been in that kind of room. Now he says, I don't know how to have school, but if we do, you're going to have to help me. Suppose that we write down a few rules. Is that all right? Yeah, they said, that's fine. You tell me, and I'll write them on the blackboard. So they made up the rules. One shouted, no stealing. Another says, be on time. Finally, when they got done, they had ten rules on the blackboard. Now, said the teacher, a law is no good unless there's a penalty attached to it for breaking it. What are we going to do to them that break these rules? And somebody says, beat him across the back ten times without his coat on. He said, that's a pretty severe penalty, boys. Are you ready to stand behind it? And they all shouted, yes. So he says, all right, school come to order. In a day or two, old Big Tom found out his lunch had been stolen. On asking around, the thief had been found, and it found out to be a little hungry boy about 10 years old. The next morning, the teacher announced, we found the thief, and he must be punished according to your rule. Ten stripes across the back. Jim, come up here. The little fellow came up trembling. He had a big coat fastened up to his neck. And he begged his teacher, you can hit me as hard as you want, but please don't make me take my coat off. He said, take that coat off. You help make the rules. So he began unbuttoning, and what did the teacher see? 
and the class, he saw that this little boy had no shirt on under that coat. All he had was some strings tied around his shoulders to hold his breeches up with a bare back, bare stomach. And the teacher says, how can I whip this child? But I gotta do something to keep this school. Everybody's quiet. He said, Jim, how come you without a shirt? He said, well, my daddy died and my mom was poor and I only got one shirt and she's washing it today, so I wore my brother's coat to keep me warm. And just then, old big old Tom jumped to his feet and said, Teacher, if you don't object, I'll take Jim's licking for him. Well, he said, there's a law that one can substitute himself for another. Everybody agreed? They all shouted, yes. Off came Tom's coat, and after five hard strokes on Tom, Big Tom's back, the rod broke. And then he heard the entire class crying, and what did he see? He turned to see that little Jim was reaching up and had his both arms around Big Tom's neck. And he says, Tom, I love you till you die for taking my licking for me. And isn't that what the gospel message is? That Jesus took my licking for me, that I could go free. Because I didn't have anything to offer. Would you call on the name of the Lord today and make this a great Easter celebration? And say, Lord, have mercy on me for my unbelief. So that's what will send you to hell is unbelief. It's not your sins. We're all sinners. Jesus said he came into the world <coughs> the world to save sinners. That's what I am. That's what you are. And he said, whoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call on him today. Whoever called on the name of the Lord will be saved. And he promised us that. Amen. Think on Jesus this Easter. Celebrate him. Celebrate the resurrection. Amen. There's no reason we can't be the happiest people on the face of this earth, no matter what happened. We got a home in heaven. We got a better place to go to. Amen. And then we'll understand all the whys about everything. Amen. Live by faith. Amen. God bless you today.